Okay, good morning, good afternoon and good evening everyone. Welcome to the peer-to-peer -peer exchange human rights education in displacement context. So my name is Elisa Gazzotti and I'm the co-chair of the task team on human rights engagement and today I will be moderating this session. Before starting, I would like to invite Valerie to give some words. Over to you, Valerie. Thank you so much, Elisa, and uh, thanks to Sogagaka International for taking the lead in uh, organization of this peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And I would say it's a very important one uh, for us uh, humanitarian actors because uh, we do a lot on the work with communities, sensitization of communities, awareness raising campaigns, accountability to affected population, etc. But we don't put enough accent or importance to raising awareness of the affected people, displaced persons, on uh, their human rights so that they can really be at the center of, uh, of our response, humanitarian response, but also to empower them and have much more sustainable response. So it's quite a new topic for humanitarians and you can see that, you know, we have relatively <laughs> less colleagues today joining and I'm openly saying it because I guess when colleagues said, OK, human rights education, how does this relate actually to my work? You know, it's as a humanitarian, what is my role in that? And this is exactly uh, the issue and we discussed that several times in the human rights engagement task team. We need to do much more. We need to start with uh, um, raising awareness amongst us, amongst humanitarians. And this is where Sogagakai International uh, expertise is uh, very useful and bringing together actors, discussing it and slowly, slowly trying to change the mindset of humanitarian actors to uh, to be more proactive, not to be afraid, not to perceive it as something too sensitive to say, etc. Ready uh, to focus on how we can empower people to know more about their human rights, how to have human rights based approach to our programs in that regard and take it forward. So thanks again, Elisa, for uh, taking this forward in the human rights engagement task team. Welcome to colleagues and uh, back over to you. Thank you so much, Valerie, and again, welcome to everyone. So as um, Valerie mentioned, it, um, it's, all, uh, it's the second time actually we are organizing this uh, kind of exchange. And uh, we, the aim is really to building on the webinar that we had done last year on 17 of June on human rights education in the humanitarian context and on the training session engaging with the affected population of the capacity building program that we developed last year. The aim of today's uh, peer to peer exchange is really to address the key role of human rights education for humanitarian workers, focusing on existing challenges and opportunities, sharing concrete case studies on human rights education for displaced people, and tackle needs and gaps of human rights education in the protection cluster context, identify if there is an interest in devising a possible project. In addition, we would like to take this occasion to officially launch the training module that we developed on human rights education in displacement context. If you can put it up, Peter, please. And um, Valerie shared already this module via email, but please do not hesitate to contact us if you have any comments or questions or if you would like to use it in your um, activities. Now I would like to introduce you uh, the agenda of today. First, we will have Paulina Tandiono, Associate Human Rights Officer at OHCHR, that will introduce the concept of human rights education. Then we will have Abdelaziz Abdelaziz, Human Rights Advisor to the Resident Coordinator, or Humanitarian Coordinator in Syria, will address trainings for humanitarian actors in the Syrian response. Then we will have Kate Turnerman, Manager of Capacity Development Asia Pacific Forum, that will speak about the human rights education ap approaches in the context of displacement. And then we will have Eka Tanline, that will come from the Indonesian National Commission on Human Rights, introducing the case study of human rights education and displacement. 
After this, as we are not so many, I would suggest that you can raise your hand or um, write in the chat introducing yourself so that we can actually really have a more open conversation and discussion. So um, now over to you, Paulina. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Elisa. Um, Valerie, uh, thank you very much for the Human Rights um, Engagement Task Team of the Global Protection Cluster for uh, inviting us, for having me here. So um, as uh, Valerie stated, um, the topic of human rights education uh, could indeed be perceived as something new for some colleagues. So that's really my role here today, which is to introduce to some of you uh, who may find this topic new and who have not worked on it, on what actually um, human human rights education is, uh, what are the basic principles, and how um, OHCHR uh, can offer in terms of providing materials and resources in this area. So I'm just going to share my screen and um, Elisa or Valerie, please let me know uh, when you can see my screen. Voilà. Yeah, all good. So basically today I will just um, cover some you know, definition and basic principles of human rights education and how actually human rights education and training has been having increasing prominence on the UN agenda. So I will also explain some initiatives and how humanitarian actors in displacement um, context can make use of these two uh, programs or initiatives. So firstly, human rights education. Uh, some of you may, may, may be wondering uh, why are we even talking about the definition of human rights education? Isn't that obvious? Human rights education means, okay, education about human rights. The answer is yes, but not only. So um, human rights education as um, defined by, you know, UN Declaration of, uh, for Human Rights Education and Training, it transforms knowledge and develops skills and attitudes that encourage behavior that will promote and protect human rights. So the, the key word here is skills and attitude that encourage behavior to promote and protect human rights, meaning it's not enough. A, a true human rights education effort is not only aiming to impart knowledge about rights, but it is also aiming to develop the skills and attitudes of people so that they can promote and protect human rights. They can claim their rights. They are empowered to take action uh, on human rights. So now, what does it mean then? How, how does it relate to humanitarian settings? So there, there will be two dimensions here. First, human rights education for right holders. What is it for? As I think Valer Valeria uh, Valerie mentioned earlier, it is really to empower right holders to claim their rights so that they can fully and meaningfully engage in decision making processes so that they can act they can be active agent, they can be active right holders, and not only passive beneficiaries. Now, when it comes to humanitarian actors, what is it for? So human rights education and training for this specific audience uh, will aim to empower humanitarian actors to adopt a human rights based approach to their work so that they can contribute better to the protection of human rights and they can also encourage states encourage duty bearers to meet their obligations now this sounds like a very big goal of human rights education in displacement context so in order to achieve this I think we can agree that human rights education is a complex undertaking. It's not only, OK, we'll do a session on human rights and that's it. So in order to achieve a successful human rights education effort and result, the methodology is key. And OHCHR has published a manual on human rights training methodology, which explains all the, you know, sound methodology that has been gathered from decades of OHCHR's work in the area of education and training. But in the interest of time, let me just summarize three main points of uh, our methodology uh, when it comes to human rights education and training. Firstly, um, it is important to note that human rights training, human rights education is a process. It is not only 
when people deliver training, that human rights training takes place. It is the whole process from planning, from designing, from delivering up until following up to the training uh, uh, training course or training efforts itself. So for each of these phases, um, the manual provides some advice on methodology and on how to go about it successfully. Secondly, it is important for a successful human rights education effort to adopt participatory approach. So what does it mean? A program that will allow the learners to participate actively a program that is uh, concentrated, that's focusing on the learner's experience so as to allow critical reflection and analysis of human rights issues so that they, the learners, could develop strategies for action. So it's really centered around the learners. And finally, on evaluation, I think there is um, a misconception on uh, evaluation being ah, it's a questionnaire at the end of a training course and that's it. We've done um, evaluation but for us. Um, no, evaluation should be infused throughout the training cycle. So even from for the planning phase, design phase, delivery phase, follow up phase, there is a way to infuse evaluation and this handbook uh, that uh, you know that that OHHR published uh, provides some guidance in this area. So now, in terms of uh, UN initiatives in the area of human rights education, allow me to uh, explain a bit on the World Program for Human Rights Education. So this is a um, a global initiative proclaimed by the General Assembly in 2004, and is uh, arranged in five consecutive uh, yearly phases. Phase one, as you can see here, it's uh, focusing on human rights education in the primary and secondary education system. We have phase two, higher education system. Phase three, uh, media professionals and journalists. And today in 2022, we are here on the fourth phase, um, which is focusing um, on youth. Now, why are we explaining about this world program? So I think it is important to um, highlight that for each phase, there is a plan of action providing really methodological guidance for each phase. For instance, for example, the one for the fourth phase, it explains about what kind of policies are um, relevant, what kind of teaching and learning process and tools, what kind of methodology to be used. In terms of um, training of educators, what kind of um, elements should be included in the curriculum and what kind of enabling environment should states uh, guarantee in order to uh, facilitate human rights education for youth. And one thing we would like to um, highlight here is that the plan of action for the fourth phase has as one of its objective a priority for young people in situations of exclusion or vulnerability, meaning humanitarian actors can use all this methodological guidance in their human rights education programming. They can um, use this plan of action as a guidance for uh, advocacy purposes for states who have indeed expressed commitment to strengthen a national implementation for human rights education, especially for youth. And the second one that we would like to cover would be the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training, which was adopted in 2011. This is really uh, the first UN document entirely dedicated to human rights education. And as it was adopted by the General Assembly, it also reaffirms the responsibility of states to promote and ensure human rights education. And just to highlight here how the declaration also um, express the importance to take into account the challenges and barriers uh, faced by persons in vulnerable and disadvantaged situations and groups, including, of course, uh, people in displacement um, situations. So just to say that um, humanitarian actors could use both of these, uh, one, the World Program, second, the UN Declaration, in their work, the World Program could be an operational framework to help them in their human rights education programming, um, 
to help them in designing um, human rights education activities um, to really to empower learners to claim their rights. And the UN declaration could be used for more advocacy purposes to encourage states to um, strengthen their commitment to human rights education and training and do more in this area. So just to conclude, um, if any of you would like more information, would like more resources, for example, if uh, you would like us to recommend some uh, resources, especially in humanitarian context, don't um, hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, we are here uh, to support everyone uh, in, human rights, in their human rights education and training efforts. Thank you. Uh, over um, back to you, Elisa. Thank you so much, Paulina, for this very comprehensive presentation on what is human rights education, the importance of methodologies, and how we can actually apply these UN initiatives in our work. Now, I would like to give the words to Abdelaziz, which is going to speak about more the role of uh, human rights education capacity building trainings um, for humanitarian workers in the context of Syria. Over to you, Abdelaziz. Please, you, the, you should uh, unmute yourself. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yes, I was just thanking you both, you, Elisa and then Valerie, uh, for the invitation, uh, you and your team. And uh, and uh, really thank Paulina, uh, my colleague Paulina, because she uh, really pre presented uh, a an important presentation on human rights education laying the foundation um, for this uh, for this discussion um, and uh, I'm here also from OCHR presenting a different aspect of our uh, OCHR engagement as uh, as a human rights advisor um, let me share my presentation uh, please um, I don't know if it is uh, showing. Yes, it's showing. Yes, Please bear yes. with me. It, it's it's a uh, yeah. I'm just trying to save this. I'm struggling a bit. Uh, it worked very well a few minutes ago. <laughs> just a second. It, it came up fine on the screen. It just didn't uh, go into presentation mode. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm sorry, uh, Peter. Uh, yeah, it showed on the screen for a moment, but it just didn't go into presentation mode, so it was working. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do to send it to presentation uh, mode. Uh, OK. Uh, what do I need to get it to actually uh, do that? I think if you share it the same way and then there's a button in the bottom uh, right of the PowerPoint that you can click to put it into presentation mode. OK, let's see. Sorry about that. No problem. And this is something at the bottom. Um. Yes, just to the just in the very bottom row on there's a slider and just to the left of the slider, there's a little presentation symbol. So you can see the bottom where there's the. The 52 percent in the slider. Just to the, the first icon to the left of that slider. Yes, that one there. Yes, now it's showing perfectly. Perfect. OK, great, great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, folks. So uh, um, so I'm, I'm Aziz Abdelaziz. I'm a uh, human rights advisor um, to the resident in tank coordinator in Damascus. Uh, 
Uh, I'm one of two human rights advisors uh, attached to the leadership of the humanitarian response in, in Syria. Um, one of um, these, I'm going to have to, sorry, uh, network is quite weak. Is there an update? Uh, so uh, we are two human rights advisors, support, advisors supporting the Imagine response in uh, in Syria. Um, uh, my, I, I cover Damascus uh, out of Beirut. Uh, my colleague uh, Elsa Lepanek covers uh, Amman and Razia and Tep uh, in what is known as the uh, is the, as the whole of Syria approach. Uh, for colleagues who are not aware of the whole of Syria approach. Uh, it is the humanitarian architecture uh, that was established uh, in 2014 pursuant to Security Council Resolution 2165 uh, that set up uh, uh, humanitarian hubs um, adding uh, Amman and Gaziantep to uh, Damascus um, after uh, issues and concerns that uh, the humanitarian assistance um, from Damascus was not reaching uh, uh, areas under control of non-state uh, actors uh, or anti-government non-state actors around the peripheries of Syria bordering Turkey and and Amman. So the OCHR deployed human rights advisors. Initially, were three: one uh, attached to each of the uh, coordinators in uh, in each of the hubs. Uh, in Damascus, there is the RCHC. In Amman, there is the uh, regional humanitarian coordinator and. Uh, in Gaziantep, there is the uh, deputy regional humanitarian uh, coordinator, and of course, there are a cluster uh, uh, system set up in uh, in the hubs with uh, Amman hosting the uh, the uh, protection sector of the whole of um, of, of Syria. Uh, so our role as human rights advisors is to support the uh, humanitarian response uh, in the integration of human rights. Uh, in the response, uh, working uh, with the human rights, with the uh, humanitarian uh, coordinator, coordinators rather, um, supporting the leadership by raising uh, uh, protection concerns, uh, um, participating uh, in the uh, design, uh, and, and as we should in the design and implementation of the humanitarian uh, program uh, uh, cycle, etc. Uh, however, one of the most important roles that uh, we have played as human rights advisors is to uh, raise awareness of uh, our humanitarian colleagues, humanitarian um, actors, uh, the cluster system, um, and beyond. Uh, in relation to the and international humanitarian law, international human rights law norms and standards to support uh, the work of colleagues who are uh, normally uh, on the ground, operational on the ground. So building the capacity of humanitarian uh, colleagues and, and partners uh, to strengthen their uh, reporting analysis and advocacy. The objective many has been to raise their awareness and knowledge and enhance their understanding of human rights uh, in, and different types of human rights mechanisms, uh, increase their ability to engage with human rights mechanisms, clarify complex IHL notions uh, to support their daily response. Um, Supporting on the legal with with trainings on the uh, legal uh, framework, international legal framework, we have provided uh, and continue to to provide uh, trainings on international uh, human rights law with a focus on uh, human rights protection in armed conflict, uh, human rights based approach to programming. Um, of course, uh, uh, maybe not at the at the moment, but uh, in when when such trainings were extremely important and most relevant, uh, 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 perhaps uh, a couple of years ago, uh, um, uh, we rolled out a number, a series of these uh, trainings, uh, slowed down in the context of COVID nineteen. 
but uh, we're scaling up this uh, th these uh, uh, trainings again. Um, we also uh, provided we provided also trainings on uh, international humanitarian law with focus on specific areas of interest for our humanitarian uh, colleagues and partners, um, particularly around this is, this is throughout the years, uh, the, the past years, um, supporting them on a, a number of, uh, of, of issues, uh, raising their capacity and understanding on some complex and, uh, notions of IHL uh, that were also the subject of legal notes uh, that uh, we've developed as OCHR. For example, in the context of Syria, indiscriminate attacks versus use of indiscriminate uh, weapons, attacks on medical facilities, uh, protection of uh, all the combat, uh, child recruitment and use, uh, sieges, um, imposition, uh, population transfer, uh, belligerent, belligerent occupation, uh, all of this under IHL. We've also provided trainings and workshops on economic and social rights, um, the right to health, the right to food, housing, education, water and sanitation. Um, we provided trainings on engagement with human rights mechanisms. Um, and an overview of human rights mechanisms, treaty bodies, special procedures, and the um, and the UPR. I'm sure colleagues know that, uh, or some may know that, uh, Syria's uh, UPR was reviewed by uh, under the UPR in uh, January, uh, and UNCT um, provided its uh, first uh, joint reports. Uh, to the process, towards the process, which is quite uh, uh, significant. Of course, uh, the UN, both actually UNCT, ACT uh, colleagues participated in that in that process. Um, we've also uh, uh, are doing now trainings on human rights and sustainable development goals in the 2030 agenda, um, a mapping human rights mechanism recommendations against SDGs, looking at the interplay between uh, uh, human rights and uh, uh, and the um, other human rights recommendations and the 2030 uh, agenda, uh, supporting uh, with a human or through human rights based approach training, the development of the uh, common country analysis for Syria strategic framework, uh, working with colleagues on human rights based uh, approach uh, also, another chain that we're designing now on to uh, HRBA to macroeconomics that would uh, assist colleagues or help colleagues uh, um, uh, design tools to uh, and methodology to assess the impact or the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures on uh, human rights or on the enjoyment of human rights in Syria, trainings on business human rights and human rights due diligence. This is just part of the of the, the work that we have done as HRAs and also uh, working with humanitarian uh, uh, colleagues and partners through uh, the civil society units uh, within our office. Um, I, I'm aware, conscious of the time, and I wasted a, a few minutes uh, early on, but just to uh, uh, conclude, of course, the, our work, um, we have to address a lot of challenges that we face, um, a lot of uh, mindset that we need to change, um, and we need to uh, get together uh, as uh, as uh, humanitarian uh, actors, um, focusing on what's important uh, and uh, really the centrality of protection is something that some that all still we need a lot of work uh, to achieve to achieve a common understanding of what that uh, what that means um, and the relationship uh, uh, when we think of protection uh, um, humanitarian protections human rights protection uh, so we hope that the uh, the call to action for human rights will give, is, offers an opportunity. Certainly, offers an opportunity for uh, for uh, for engagement. Another opportunity for us to uh, to work together uh, um, um, in in the field. Um, I realize the time. I will stop here and happy to uh, take uh, take questions afterwards. Thanks very much. And sorry about the the, the minutes I wasted at the beginning. Thanks so much, over to you. 
Thanks so much, Abdelaziz. No worries at all. That was perfect and it was really um, important to listen to the concrete work you do with humanitarian workers. So thank you so much again. I would like now to pass um, the word to Kate, which is going to give us an um, overall perspective about the different human rights education approaches in the context of displacement. Over to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Elisa, and thank you, Valerie, for the invitation and the broader um, human rights engagement task team for the opportunity to come speak. I'm going to quickly share something in the chat box for you all, which is our manual on human rights education for reference. I'll explain that in a minute. And I'm also going to just quickly share my screen. So hopefully you'll be able to all see my screen. Um, my name is Kate Turnerman and I'm the manager of capacity development for the Asia Pacific Forum of National Human Rights Institutions. I'm actually calling in to this meeting from Canberra in Australia, so a little bit further away from Geneva or perhaps wherever you're dialing in from today. But it's a pleasure to be joining with you and I, I'd like to just thank my previous presenters for providing such a, a wonderful over, overarching framework for human rights education and especially hearing about the work that OHCHR is doing in Syria. It's it's um it's really, really illuminating. So thank you so much. Um, making sure my PowerPoint presentation works. OK, so in the time that we have available, just very quickly, I wanted to focus on two main points. First and foremost, the role of national human rights institutions um, as humanitarian actors, perhaps there's not as um, so much familiarity as of NHRIs or national human rights institutions, or perhaps you've come across them. So I wanted to clarify their role and the work that they've been doing. Also, as a side note, I wanted to advocate for them as partners in humanitarian context to really bring in those human rights dimensions as we've been listening to before. And I also wanted to talk to you about some human rights education approaches in the context of development. So very quickly, for those of you who are not aware, the Asia Pacific Forum, the organisation I re represent, is a member based organisation of national human rights institutions across the Asia Pacific. We have a very broad definition of the Asia Pacific, as you can probably see from the map on my screen at the moment. Um, we have members based in Samoa, um, New Zealand in the Pacific, all the way to Palestine and Jordan in West Asia. So quite a diverse grouping of national human rights institutions here. Um, I won't go too much into this again, but just to reiterate what Paulina was saying about human rights education seeking to empower through knowledge, skills, attitudes and behaviours. And I would invite you to think of human rights education in its broadest possible sense. And I'll explain that in a minute um, in my presentation. But just to really reiterate um, the perspective from the APF as well, you know, we have different agencies talking about human rights, but we're talking about it, human rights education rather, but we are talking about it from the exact same place. Human rights education is about empowering um, empowering people to better understand their rights. Now, national human rights institutions, they are quasi-judicial bodies that are mandated by law or an act of parliament or legislation to promote and protect human rights. And they do this through a variety of different functions. They advise government on human rights uh, based policies and approaches. They monitor human rights compliance with their um, from their governments at the national level in their countries. They also investigate complaints on human rights violations and abuses. And another core part of their function is human rights education. So they focus their work on rights holders, duty bearers, influencers, and they implement a variety of different human rights education theory to achieve the goals that they're seeking. But fundamentally, Human rights education is underpinned by these six principles. And just expanding on what Paulina has already mentioned, for human rights education to be truly impactful, to be truly empowering, it needs to be relevant. And this is in the context of displacement, an exceptionally important consideration to make sure that these principles are embedded into all of your human rights education work. It really needs to be relevant to the the participant who's going through the process to their experience and their 
concepts or their context rather that they're in. It needs to be collaborative. It needs to be developed in partnership with those you're seeking to work with. It needs to be participatory and participant centred. What is it that the participant really wants to get out of it? Where are they coming from? What's their barriers or what are their challenges or what are their opportunities when working with you in this program? It needs to be probing as well. You know, human rights education is a, a lifelong process. Learning about human rights is a continuous process, especially if you're coming from a position of not understanding that you had rights in the first place or the, your particular situation, such as those in, in displacement context, has added new dimensions to your human rights being violated or limitations to you being able to fully access your human rights. So it needs to, human rights education needs to be probing. It needs to go under the surface and get people to really reflect and think about how it is working for them, how it is working in their communities. What does this look like in practice? Ideally, you would really want human rights education to inspire thoughtful action. So when they leave a room virtual or in person or when they've gone through a human rights education activity with you, it's empowered them to think about what are the next steps I need to take? What do I need to know or what do I need to do in order to fully access my rights? And it's about being transforming. We're here to help people realise their rights, so we really want this human rights education activity to be as transforming as humanly possible. Now, the manual, the link to the manual that I posted in the chat box is the APF's um, Guide to Human Rights Education. It is written for national human rights institutions, <laughs> so it might not be um, as relevant to your particular context in terms of the legal mandate and setup of an NHRI, but the principles and the multi different the multi methods of human rights education are applicable no matter which agency team or what kind of human rights actor you are. They are applicable across the board. And this is where I would encourage you to think about human rights education in its broadest sense. It's not just about people sitting down in a classroom and delivering information to them about their rights. It's a combination of a multiple different approaches underpinned by these core principles to help empower people to learn about human rights and act on on their um, act on their new knowledge after they've contrib contributed or been part of an activity. So we've got information sharing, which, you know, in the context of displacement is incredibly relevant for people who may not be aware that they have, um, say, for example, rights to access their information, their documentation as well. It's a there's also training which can happen online, face to face over WhatsApp. You know, the last couple of years has taught us to be very creative in different ways that we're delivering training. Human rights education can be really facilitative. It can be this process of facilitating a conversation to probe deeper thinking and reflection and to challenge understanding and concepts as well. And, and this is particularly important for displacement, especially when you have very mixed assumptions between a, a community that has been displaced or coming into a community that's established and perhaps tensions that arise from that. And NHRIs have a really strong role to play here in their human rights education work to facilitate these dialogues and conversations to break down break down assumptions and stereotypes in the context of displacement. You know, human rights education is all about relationship management, stakeholder engagement, bringing people on board for the journey for you. And it's also about advocacy for rights. And lastly, it's about community led development, which is which I think is one point I'd like to highlight in particular in the context of displaced communities, this is really driven from how they want to see their future shaped, what they want to get out of it. And it's about them taking ownership and charge of their rights in a community to understand what their development needs and context are. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to very, very briefly just mention this as well. As in addition to the principles, the six human rights education principles I, me I mentioned in the multi-method approach, and I think, Paulina, you, you summed it up perfectly when you said it's more complex than people <laughs> um, give it credit to, but gender mainstreaming in 
especially in displacement context, is a very, very important consideration for your human rights education activities. We want to make sure that gender norms or discrimination is not perpetuated, and we need to make sure that we understand the unique gender dimensions of displacement context for the people that we're working with. I'm not going to have time to go too much into the rest of it, but I just really, really wanted to, to reiterate um, that when we are undertaking a human rights education activity, it's very important that we focus on the change that we want to see. What is the outcome we are ultimately seeking? As I said, people have these assumptions that human rights education is just a training. People will rock up to a classroom and have information delivered. That's not necessarily the case, and especially not when you're working with a very vulnerable community who are quite disparate. They're in new and, and very dangerous and, and precarious context as a nature of their displacement. You really need to be working with them to think about what it is that they want to see at the end, the outcome that we're ultimately seeking, not just focusing on the, the delivery of the training model as well. And just wrapping up very quickly for human rights education activities and in the context of displacement to be truly effective, they need to be based on these human rights education principles and they apply all across all different methods of human rights education approaches, not just um, not just assumptions about what human rights education is. It's a very, very broad subject. So when you're undertaking your human rights education activities, we need to ensure that we adequately adequately plan. We focus on the outcomes, not just the outputs or not just the product, and we make sure that gender is considered throughout the entire process as well. Now, national human rights institutions use these approaches and they use their mandate to apply this in very different settings. And the, the value that they really, really bring in these displacements contexts is that ability to be educating states um, to be educating the displaced community, to be educating um, other stakeholders that are involved in this on what are the rights, obligations, what are the human rights dimensions, and especially in humanitarian settings where you have conflict or perhaps a natural disaster, um, they really bring that human rights expertise, that community knowledge, so that proper systems of delivery and assistance and going forward in the humanitarian action cycle, human rights is underpinned throughout the whole process so that inequalities aren't exacerbated, so that human existing human rights issues are not worsened, and so that recovery efforts can be built on solid human rights foundations. I think I, I've run a little bit over, but I'm just going to pass now. And of course, if there's any questions, you can email me at the end and I'll take questions in the forum. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate, for this very comprehensive presentation about the role of national human rights institutions and the different approach, approaches on human rights education. Now I would like to give the word to Eka, which is coming from the Indonesian National Commission on Human Rights, and she will give us a concrete perspective, a concrete case studies of human rights education in displacement context. Over to you, Eka. Thank you, Elisa, and thank you, Valerie, for uh, inviting me in this uh, very wonderful event. But uh, first, let me uh, turn off my camera first for the stability of my internet in here. So uh, my name is Eka Kristinixi uh, Tanlain. You can call me Eka. I'm the one who wear yellow search on the uh, Kate presentation PowerPoint. Um, Okay, and I will share uh, our experience um, regarding human rights education related on internally displaced person or IDPs and also uh, for humanitarian. Because uh, lately I also work in issue uh, humanitarian worker, but in the other, uh, not not uh, not focus on the human rights education but or on uh, psychological impact of our work <laughs> because it's it's we have a similar psychological impact become a humanitarian worker or a human rights educator or uh, become human rights defender so i work in the indonesian national commission on human rights uh, or it's usually called komnas ham uh, we have some uh, we have several mandates uh, 
we do research, education, investigation, may, uh, mediation, and then we also uh, have to investigate gross human rights violation, uh, and then monitoring for uh, race at ethnic discrimination and also handling uh, conflict social. So we have four law as our uh, based on our work. Um, and uh, in this few years, we have uh, some strategic issue. Uh, the first one is uh, gross human rights violation and then agrarian conflict and then violence by the authority or by the community and then freedom of opinion and expression and also extremism with violence and intolerance. And the last one is access to justice. Although we have a strategic issue, it doesn't mean we didn't have a concern for others' uh, human rights issue. We still have a concern for others' human rights issue, but the strategic issue is to, to, to answer uh, the complaint from uh, civil society that uh, we receive. And uh, talk about uh, displacement in Indonesia. Uh, before 1999, IDPs did not uh, get enough attention because there were um, not many cases. But after the reformation, after changes of political situation, and because of our geographical location itself, uh, IDPs become one of the problem that occur in Indonesia. Uh, the reason is, of course, the conflict, uh, like in Papua. It is until today we still have a conflict there and then of violence um, like conflict in Sampit uh, it is between two uh, two ethnic uh, Maduris and then uh, Dayak and then conflict in Ambon it's between uh, two uh, religion uh, Muslim and then a Christian and then uh, the tragedy of May 1988 and then uh, displacement because of disaster like a tsunami in Aceh in uh, 2004 and then the eruption of Mount um, Rapi in 2006 and 2010 and the others. We uh, we have a lot of potential uh, earthquake, uh, violence eruption, tsunami because of our geographical location. And we, uh, Komnasam also uh, notice some displacement because of another reason. For example, uh, a lot of uh, teenager transgender who was expelled from uh, their family because of their gender expression and they have to move out uh, from their home without uh, any legal document. So usually they make a, a community and because they don't have any legal document, they cannot access any uh, education, health service, so um, they become a marginalized um, community. So, uh, in fact, the IDPs, uh, they have some rights. They have free from uh, torture, slavery, human trafficking, forced marriage, and then uh, a lot of things. And then uh, actually state have obligation to respect, uh, protect, and fulfill their privacy, uh, right to work, social security, and then um, right to edu on education and even right to use uh, their uh, their own language because Indonesia uh, has a lot of language. Uh, English is my third, so sorry if I speak broken English. Um, and with this kind, with this lot of rights, do the state understand about this? Do humanitarian workers know about it? Do uh, activists or human rights defenders already understand about this? And especially, do the IDPs itself um, know their rights? And this is the problem. Um, many of um, IDPs itself, even uh, state as duty barrier, and also humanitarian or um, or social worker or human rights defender didn't uh, didn't know exactly what is their rights. So um, it's important to um, to conduct human rights uh, training, human rights education uh, for the IDPs itself to know and to claim their right. Uh, and then for humanitarian, we hope that. Uh, human rights education can be um, guided uh, that can be used in their work so, uh, so 
they they do their work not only based on charity but also because it is the right of the idps itself and from uh, for 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 the duty barrier uh, is of course to encourage them to respect protect and fulfill the uh, idps right like uh, uh, paulina and uh, kate already mentioned human rights education is about empower the participant empower the learner to uh, take action so it's, it's very important to give um, the training not only for the idps or for the humanitarian but also for the duty uh, barrier who uh, or for state uh, and um, like you know in in here um, idps is a matter of charity not the obligation so usually um, uh, usually uh, uh, even even the states even the government or humanitarian is used a charity approach not a right based approach in um, in fulfill protect or um, uh, the right of uh, the idps so uh, what we do uh, is already a long time ago, we conduct special training on IDPs. Uh, it is uh, on 2006. Um, it's 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 series of the training for the IDPs, for the state apparatus and um, for um, the um, uh, humanitarian worker too. And besides uh, the training, because human rights education is also about sharing the knowledge, we also make some publication, a lot of publication related on the IDPs. And uh, we haven't have much related uh, on refugee, uh, but we have uh, some on uh, IDPs. And then, um, uh, although, Although we already um, do the training, uh, but like you know, uh, as I mentioned before, that IDPs is not our strategic issue right now. So uh, training for humanitarian or IDPs uh, usually focus on psychological first aid, on trauma healing, disaster mitigation, or economic empowerment, and it's usually conducted by the other agencies or the other uh, institution. And human rights training have not given proper attention or never taken place again until 2006. We haven't have any uh, training again specific on uh, the IDPs, and then uh, different priorities of the uh, institution like um, like you know uh, we have another strategic issue and in in Indonesia we also uh, consider many many agencies of institution consider human rights are the obligation for law ministry only it's, it doesn't relate uh, for um, a ministry of Education. It doesn't have a relate with a Ministry of Health. In fact, when we talk about human rights, we talk about many aspects, but only few, uh, still many, uh, many state apparatus who doesn't understand this. And uh, IDP is also not considered as important issue, although there are a lot of conflict that um, then cause the IDPs and still uh, it's used a charity approach and um, when we deliver training usually the state apparatus or even humanitarian stuff um, they feel they already knew uh, they feel they already done the best uh, um, but um, and some of humanitarian didn't 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 think that human rights are their issue like valerie mentioned uh, on the um, opening um, sometimes um, they didn't want to join the training because they say they are busy uh, they, uh, they don't need the human rights uh, education training and uh, some of um, um, IDPs is uh, some of state apparatus usually um, it's 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 not um, it's um, they have a conflicting value with their own value. Uh, 
for example, IDPs because of um, uh, conflict of the religion, some of state apparatus still um, still use their own value when they conduct their uh, their uh, duties. That's why it's it's really uh, it's 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 quite difficult to conduct training on uh, for the state apparatus or even for uh, humanitarian. And of course, human human rights education until today is considered not important. Although actually, we have a lot of impact because of human rights uh, education. And so, what we do with uh, a lot of challenging and uh, in this situation, um, because of the our strategic issue, we have uh, uh, three target group in well, for human rights education. Uh, target group one is police officer, and then government officer, and then um, the other is uh, civil society. Um, we divide uh, into two big pillars for the human rights education. First is uh, we do campaign or dissemination, and then the second is training. And then uh, for campaign, it usually we we make a podcast because uh, like Pauline mentioned, um, right now is pro for, for a world program, it will, the human rights education must be focused on youth. So this podcast is for the answering uh, that uh, world program for human rights education. We have a target group, uh, youth target group for the podcast. And then a webinar or seminar, and then open journal system, and then publication, and uh, also doing uh, dissemination on social media. And we also have a training, but now we focus on three kind of training: basic human rights training, human rights uh, human uh, human rights cities training, and then freedom of expression training. Uh, but although we only have three kind of training or three three big uh, issue training, actually we put or we insert a lot of um, uh, other issue in this training. Uh, it's depend on the in the um, in the region we conduct the training or it depend on the current uh, cur uh, current situation. Um, so like uh, when we deliver human rights uh, cities training for the region who have IDPs, uh, we will uh, use a lot of case study uh, related on IDPs or related on um, uh, intolerance. So uh, that is the first one. Um, the, the first technique is we insert uh, the IDPs issue, uh, the displace, uh, displacement uh, issue to our training. Or the second way is we um, try to, to solve the root. This uh, usually is caused by the intolerance. Intolerance because of religion, intolerance because of the ethnic. So we conduct a lot of training, a lot of campaigns related uh, or promoting tolerance. It, it's also become our uh, our strategic issue. Uh, that is why uh, uh, one of our strategy we not um, use IDPs uh, as um, as per se, but we put it in the uh, tolerance umbrella. And uh, from this kind of um, this kind of activity, human rights education, uh, we have some uh, best practice. Uh, for example, when we conduct a training, uh, we never conduct training now, right now. We never conduct training for specific group or only for one group. We always combine from state apparatus and then for activists or humanitarian worker and for the uh, survivor or uh, in in this context we uh, we will um, invite uh, the IDPs and then uh, we set the ground rules. We build comfortable learning environment, which is uh, usually we we use a lot of learning games, uh, um, so they they will feel more enjoy the the, the learning process, not uh, not feel stressed because of the learning situation, and 
uh, we do a lot of fun too in this in the training and then uh, we use adult learning participatory approach uh, because we, we we knew that each participant has and their knowledge has their uh, own experience um, we uh, as a human rights educator only as a facilitator who help transfer the knowledge between the uh, between the participants and then also we uh, of course need to choose the best methods who allow participants uh, to to have a reflect uh, to to uh, to to feel to feel uh, themselves how to uh, how if they become the the minority itself how if they become the idp uh, itself so um, usually uh, this one uh, we usually uh, use case study movie streaming and the best one who who almost uh, our participant love is role play so um, they they can experience experience themselves as idps and then uh, during the, the the process they can reflect oh my god i still as a state apparatus uh, i still do this one not this one i still uh, I still put away my own value and do my duty or uh, uh, with uh, uh, do my duty, and it it give uh, them time to thinking again what should they do, what they can do to improve um, their participation in promoting uh, human rights, and then also of course inspire them to uh, to acting. We use a lot of method for role play. It can be using a privilege game. I uh, I give the um, the the link of the YouTube in that you can uh, you can check later. Uh, or you can uh, make script that will be that will be developed by their uh, by the participant itself. It's it's not only um, it's not only help us in experiencing, reflecting, thinking, and uh, motivate participant to acting, but it's also a very fun process for the uh, for the uh, participant itself. And then. Um, in our training because of the uh, uh, the comfortable learning in for uh, environment usually it can be bridge uh, become between the state apparatus and then uh, uh, humanitarian worker and the idps it's it's um, they they knew it's other position uh, so they can communicate better in the future and the sums uh, in the sums area even they collaborate collaborate in promoting and um, um, or uh, promoting uh, human rights so um, with a lot of uh, challenge and then uh, best practice we also learn that we still work in monitoring and evaluation uh, process so sometimes um, a communication that already built a uh, very uh, felt built good in the, in the training process is not uh, follow up by the participant or by us so we still work on the monitoring uh, evaluation but still uh, since last year we uh, try to uh, give more concern on monitoring and evaluation and uh, like Paulina said, it's not only pre and post test, but how we monitor after the training um, and um, how we uh, know the, uh, the the development of the participant after the training. Uh, so right now we are also developing uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation too. That's all um, our uh, experience. Uh, thank you, Elisa. Back to you. Thanks so much, Eka, for sharing all your important work and including challenges and best practice. I would like to thank you all of you again for uh, bringing these important perspectives. Now I would like to open the floor for questions and answers. We will have about 20 minutes, more or less. So please raise your hand or write in the chat box and introduce yourself. I see first Leonor, so please over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for sharing their insights. Um, I guess my question is really around in this context of HRE in a displacement uh, framework, 
Uh, I might have missed the point, but um, we talk about IDPs and humanitarian actors, but I'm quite interested in learning a bit more around hosting communities. How do we go about uh, doing HRE with the host communities, both displays and host uh, programming around that. So I would be really grateful. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Leonor. Would you mind maybe introduce yourself and if your question is directed to us? Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. I apologize. My name is Leonor Valera Stavuada. I'm um, advisor at Amnesty International, Amnesty International uh, Norway Human Rights Education. Thank you. Thank you so much. So over to you. Would you like who would like to take this question? Paulina? Um, I, <laughs> I, I can just jump in with a quick um, reflection and then Paulina, sorry, did I interrupt you? <laughs> no, no, okay, good. Um, this is the thing about online meetings. Sometimes you can't tell when you accidentally speak over the top of someone, so I do apologise, Paulina. Um, I just wanted to say, I guess, um, speaking from the experience of national human rights institutions, for humanitarian actors and um, the Global Protection Cluster actors, I think they're a really good stakeholder to be engaged with, especially when you want to be speaking to host communities for the reason that they are the, you know, they're the, they do have a lot of national, they do have a lot of national human rights expertise to draw from. And because of their unique position, they have this ability to be able to connect with different stakeholders as well. So they are really, I see them as, and I would like to advocate um, for our humanitarian actors in the, and our partners here in the Global Protection Cluster, I'd like to advocate for engaging with NHRIs as a core stakeholder for your work because they have a sense of the human rights situation of the country, because they might have access to these host communities, for example. So um, just quickly, the National Human Rights Commission of Bangladesh, for example, when the Rohingya refugees were fleeing um, Myanmar, there was a lot of tension within Cox's Bazaar from the host community having to um, having to all of a sudden take care of or accommodate for um, the Rohingya refugees that were fleeing across the border as well. So when they were undertaking their monitoring work, not only were they speaking to the Rohingyas, but they were actually speaking to the host community as well and hearing their concerns and they discovered and it's kind of unsurprising, but they they did discover a lot of instances where there was uh, increased tensions and discriminations because the host communities felt that the government had completely neglected them and weren't actually providing for their needs as well. And in the establishment of humanitarian shelters or in the delivery of humanitarian aid, what was missing was understanding the underlying issues and infrastructure challenges and problems and human rights um, issues that the host community was facing as well. So they were seeing a discrepancy of service delivery when they perhaps were also feeling um, impacted by the sheer amount of people coming into their, their community as well. So I would advocate for human rights um, institutions to be a very good stakeholder in these particular instances because they they can under, they know the national context of what's going on. They have a mandate to monitor this human rights situation and they can afford you different um, access to governments and different agencies and different communities and stakeholders to, by virtue of their role. Um, I guess as an extension of that more broadly, in terms of best practices for um, how you start working with um, start working with host communities, I feel that you know there is going to be this trying to understand what the tensions are and what the and balance those tensions out and then taking them to state um, or duty bearers or state or state departments who actually have responsibility to be looking for these or disaster management authorities as well to to really understand what are the needs of the host community and and seeing NHRIs as potential stakeholders who could help broker those conversations and, and facilitate those dialogues as well. I don't think there's ever been a model where it's gone very smoothly and we have a host community who's willingly accepted a displaced community but um, but I feel that there's a lot of work that can be done in opening and facilitating dialogues through national human rights institutions to address some of those concerns and and try to to um, face those challenges before they 
effectively transpire into bigger, broader systemic issues of discrimination and um, and violations. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Yes, over to you, Paulina. Thank you, uh, Elisa. And no worries, Kate. I, I don't think you interrupted at all. So um, I just wanted to um, thank you, Leona, for the question. I also wanted to share my experience from when I was working with the um, UN Refugee Agency back in um, Indonesia, uh, Jakarta, where I'm from. So um, basically, when it comes to the hosting community, it is important to uh, look at human rights education from two perspectives. First is to make sure to sensitize the hosting community on, for instance, for instance, from my experience, who refugees are, that they're not only a number in the statistics, that they're also human beings with family having to flee from the war, from conflict, basically to put these two together, the hosting community and the refugees, you know, in, in a context where they're all human beings sharing common humanity having the same human rights so i think first is back to um, what i was trying to say is first really to sensitize them on how everyone uh irrespective of their situation is human. And secondly, we also looked at it from the fact that uh, it is important to create activities where both the hosting communities and um, the displaced persons, again, in, in my experience, uh, were refugees, you know, to do something together um, some um, simple activities as an extension to um, the human rights education or training, like, for instance, uh, they do some sort of um, community cleaning together. That way they really, um, uh, they really see the others, not as us versus them, but they're all living now in the same community and, um, and you know, the displaced persons can also contribute to the community. So just to share our uh, uh, this experience, and I think as a as important um, stakeholders to be involved in, you know, human rights education training efforts, um, you know, for hosting community. Um, in addition to what Kate said, a national human rights institution is in a very good position to help out in this. But also, I think important would be a representative from the hosting community themselves to really understand. Um, uh, what is it that they need in order to facilitate, you know, better dialogue between the, you know, between the displaced person as well as their hosting uh, community? And second stakeholder would be the displaced persons themselves. So I think in um, this kind of um, learning and training effort, it is important to involve as key partners, representatives from the hosting community as well as the displaced persons in every step of the uh, process in, um, in planning, in designing, in even delivering and following up to the training effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pauline and Kate. Um, Eka Abdelaziz, would you like to add anything? Eka, over to you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, already uh, answered by uh, Kate and uh, and Paulina. But uh, yes, we when we conduct a, a training, we have to um, do assessment. Uh, if Paulina talk about um, a refugee, it's also happen in uh, IDPs um, IDPs context because some uh, housing community sometimes didn't didn't want to uh, receive the IDPs itself because uh, usually in here because of a different uh, different belief. So we we have to engage a lot of stakeholder um, in promoting human rights education, uh, not only for humanitarian, uh, but also um, um, civil, uh, I mean, so society leader, leader of the society, even uh, uh, religion leader. Uh, yeah. That is some. Um, <laughs> thank thank you. you so much, Eka. Thank you. We do have now two more questions. Uh, I see now Samir, so please over to you, Samir. Thank you. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Elisa. Uh, my question actually relates to some of the discussion we just had in relation to the last question. Uh, I wanted to start just by touching on that first. Um, in relation to what Kate was mentioning about Cox's Bazaar, I wanted to ask because it was my understanding that in Cox's Bazaar, when there was a big influx of the Rohingya refugees, at the beginning, at least for a full one year, there was a very strong environment of sympathy from the government as well as from the host community towards the Rohingya refugees based on what they had suffered. And during that time, I think we as humanitarians missed that crucial boat of establishing or taking advantage of that already existing sort of social cohesion. And I think then we have ran into the usual challenges. So I'm just wondering maybe in relation to that and a bit more generally as well. If we go to the first step, what are some of the approaches that we that we need or that we can take to create that space and acceptance for human rights education? So in some places we have national human rights institutions or some places the uh, relevant entities are a bit more let's say open to the idea of human rights education. So how do we so in the absence of those situations or in situations where there was maybe a positive environment and now it's become more fraught, how do we convince an audience and sometimes an unwilling audience of the value of human rights education before we can actually create the space for us to do it? So the initial first step. And I was wondering if I could uh, trouble Aziz to share some practical examples on the same thing about overcoming the challenges of uh, acceptance for human rights education as an initial hurdle, because uh, I'm sure Aziz, uh, Aziz definitely has navigated several of those. Thank you so much, Samir. So who would like to take the first question and then second question is for Abdelaziz. Thank you. Kate and Paulina, would you like to take the first one? Um, I think I, I well, first of all, Samir, thank you very much for your reflections. And I think it's a really important point to, to understand where these opportunities lie for potential cohesion or to jump on these initiatives um, when they're there and that willingness and is there to try and support as much as possible. So I just like to acknowledge your point. I think that's a very, very, it's a very, very interesting reflection and, and definitely something that we can take forward. Um, in terms of the the second point, um, I I actually just wanted to jump in and, and note your your very first point. I, I don't actually have experience myself working in this particular context. I, I work through um, the experiences of our NHRI, so I might have to, to bow out this one for another one of our colleagues who actually has those experiences on the ground. Thank you so much, Kate. Eka Paulina, would you like to take the first one? Um, hi, Samir, thank you for the question. Um, I, I would like to just echo uh, Kate's, Kate's point that um, I think it's a very valid concern. Uh, I think in, in at least in our experience, um, human rights education is and training efforts, it's only one part of a broader um, human rights work. So uh, for us, usually before we even, uh, you know, uh, arrive at the point where we think there is a need for human rights education, we would, um, as an office, um, and it is included in our manual that we, we have just shared that it is important to conduct uh, an overarching kind of analysis on to, to see where and if human rights education is part of the solution because um, not every pro problem, not every issue can be answered, can be addressed by human rights education. And when there indeed is a need for that, and there is um, an, a knowledge, skill, attitude gap that can be uh, addressed by human rights education, then we start all the, the, the phases that we mentioned, planning, design, delivery, um, etc. So just to say that, um, Timing is really important indeed, but I, I think it is also important to see human rights education not as a panacea for for every uh, uh, problem that 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 every human rights problem that takes place because human rights education it solves uh, knowledge uh, skills and attitude gap, but not you know the human rights issue as a whole. Um, um, I, I hope that kind of um, touches uh, at least upon your question. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Paulina. I'm afraid in um, 
for timing and purpose, I need to pass now to the second uh, question that Samir poses to Abdelaziz directly, if that's okay, Abdelaziz. Samir, I'm so, hi Samir, I'm so sorry, I may have just missed the question because of the network. Could you please repeat? Hi Aziz, I was just asking if you wanted to maybe share one example of you know how you've navigated the challenge of creating willingness in an audience to receive that human rights education because I know you have a wealth of experience in that. But if not, I will I can always trouble you bilaterally to to ask more as well. Yeah, I mean I think it's uh, Samir. I, I mean, you are actually of, of of everyone here probably the most aware of the challenges that we face uh, as human rights advisors and in, in, in integrating human rights in a mutual response. Uh, you just being our really direct interlocutor in, in Amman, but I know that uh, Valerie as well is very well aware of these uh, of these issues. But uh, I think it's it's uh, for us. It's really it's very important in terms of um, showing the added value of OC OCHR's engagement, of OCHR's role, and indicating that we have uh, something to uh, to contribute. And I think in uh, in uh, around the times where uh, where we were doing. Uh, uh, rolling out these trainings uh, much more than these days, of course, as you know, but um, but it really helped us integrate and it helped us uh, support colleagues. Um, like for example, uh, when so it really comes down to relevance. Huh? Oh, it's uh, I think uh, was it uh, Valerie or Elisa earlier on were saying uh, something about like colleagues are saying, what is it for me? What is this? How does that relate to my work? This human rights education. So human rights trainings for us, it was really uh, uh, not uh, proselytizing, but rather just sharing, uh, you know, valid, uh, rele relevant information to colleagues. Um, as I mentioned, all the work on the legal notes, for example, when our colleagues in Syria were trying, were struggling to, uh, for example, everyone knows about the barrier bombs. Uh, that, uh, that 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 caused wreak havoc and killed so many people in Syria, uh, and uh, like in uh, since 2015, and for uh, four or five years, um, that colleagues thought these were, you know, there was a question of is this is this a, 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 an indiscriminate weapon, uh, or is it used indiscriminately? So uh, a, a legal note and training on that um, ex explain to them the the significance of, uh, uh, of the, these differences. That yeah, well, it is uh, it, it, it is uh, is not necessarily an indiscriminate weapon unless it's used in uh, you know on on civilians. Uh, then they would have the effect of a of, of a indiscriminate weapon. All of the information, all the uh, situations around uh, uh, transfers and, and deals, evacuations, population transfer. It was very important for our colleagues. They were struggling uh, to, uh, to, 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 to make sure that they are not also facilitating human rights and IHL violations by getting, uh, 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 you know, population moved from their homes to another area on the other side of the country uh, just because someone else had uh, agreed on their behalf and whether that was uh, you know informed consent or not so all of all of these were there was a real need for 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 colleagues uh, there was thirst for this information and and I think we had the right angle um, at the time and that's how it how it worked uh, the less these issues have become the, the 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 of course the the gap the wider the gap again right now our colleagues in Syria are facing uh, the impact of the unilateral coercive measures unilateral sanctions on a on, on the meltdown in Syria and that is paralyzing even the material response uh, in addition to the population of course in terms of uh, economic and social rights so how do you assess the uh, the negative impact of human rights on the, of, of sanctions on human rights uh, and how do you uh, dis distinguish it from 
uh, the, uh, the the external and you know conflict related external factor internal factors that are not necessarily related to the US or the EU imposing sanctions on on on, on Syria. So it's a lot of work and there's a lot of interest in actually learning how to look at macroeconomics uh, through uh, an HRBA lens to be able to, to reach these uh, assessments. So it's really relevant, Samir. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a two-way street and uh, it's, never, it's never been, we want to do, uh, you know, an H if you just go out and say, I want to do an HRBA training, uh, you'd never get a response. But uh, Samir knows that uh, a couple of days ago, we received an email saying the, uh, the ISG, uh, the intercluster group is interested in Syria, is interested in a, a training on human rights based approach <laughs> to programming, which we find very, very interesting and we look forward to doing that. Sorry about the very long answer to me. No, you. thank you so much, Abdelaziz. Uh, yes, very um, important. I saw Said, um, you had your um, hand up. So we are running out of time, but if for you is fine, we can maybe take the last question and then close. If you can stay a bit longer. I don't know if Said you still want to ask the question or if you have to go. I think maybe that he already left actually. So I think yes, we are coming to a hand. I would like to thank really all the participants and the speakers for participating in, in this webinar, in this peer-to-peer -peer exchange. I would like to invite again, uh, especially the um, protection cluster coordinators, if there is an interest in human rights education in having a specific project for the um, cluster, to please contact me, Valerie uh, and Peter. And uh, yes, we remain at your disposal. Also, if you have some comments about the, the training materials that we developed, please contact us because your feedback is very important. And uh, yes, thank you so much again. Um, I don't know if Valerie, would you like to have some closing words or? I think that's completely fine. Thank you so much, Elisa, for organizing today's peer to peer exchange on human rights education and colleagues just to let you know that our next uh, session is on 20th of uh, on, of April, uh, so in about two weeks, and we will focus on climate change and human rights angle. So you will receive an invitation. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank have you. a wonderful day. You too. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.